Right now on To The Point. Breaking news, schools and homes on lockdown in Woodland. We are in negotiations with that suspect. Plus another school in Sacramento on lockdown. A student is shot just hours ago, putting parents and students on high alert. Preparing for incoming storms. What you can do right now for your home insurance. And as the Niners head to the Super Bowl, meet the local retired player rooting for their victory and studying their moves. But first tonight, breaking news in Woodland, a standoff with a man on a roof just came to an end. Thank you so much for joining us. This is To The Point. I'm Alex Bell. This is all happening in the area of Ashley Avenue and South Bremer Street in Woodland. Dozens of homes and two schools were on lockdown. Our Luke Cleary is live out there tonight. And Luke, what are the latest updates? Yeah, well, Alex, it was a frantic afternoon here in Woodland. A man jumping from roof to roof, and police say that they believe that he may have been armed and a danger to this neighborhood. He is now in custody tonight, and so people can breathe a sigh of relief. But you have to remember that this all played out very close to a number of elementary schools that had to go into lockdown for hours. We have some video of the moment that he turned himself in. You can see him there in cuffs. The suspect is 39 year old Jeffrey Card and police say that it began at about 1:30 this afternoon and officers saw him in his vehicle and tried to initiate a traffic stop because he was wanted on a warrant for uh, assault with a deadly weapons charge an earlier charge and so police say that he left his car ran away on foot and somehow made his way up onto a rooftop they gathered a number of family, friends, neighbors, all of them trying to encourage this man to come down and turn himself in. We talked to one of those neighbors tonight. Just come down, it's not worth it. You know, you can fight cases and everything. I mean, he's got a son to look after and other than that, he's good. And finally, so that man did come down and turn himself in as you saw him there in cuffs and as i mentioned that this all played out very close to a number of schools parents for hours not knowing what the situation was or when they would be able to reunite with their children the suspect no doubt will be facing some additional charges related to tonight's events we'll continue to follow this story as it develops but for now we'll send it back to you alex all right, Luke, thank you so much. And tonight, Sacramento police are investigating a shooting at Grant Union High School. A student was shot and another was taken into custody. It happened around 10 this morning. Parents and community advocates rushed to the scene. And tonight, Roxana Elias has more on how they're coping with the situation. Alex, dozens of parents arrived here on scene shortly after the shooting. One worried mother telling us off camera that her daughter was inside in class when she texted her mom. There's a shooting. I love you. It's not exactly clear how many students witnessed the incident, but what is clear is that many parents and students were left traumatized. She called me. She was like, Dad, I think I heard a shooting. And I was like, um, well, what, you know, how many sounds did you hear? Shortly before 10 Tuesday morning, students at Grant Union High School began calling their parents to notify them of a shooting on campus. The school was immediately put on lockdown. We were all just sitting there waiting with no real news for a little bit. And then we heard, oh, yeah, no, someone got shot in the arm. There's an ambulance. Sacramento police responded to the shot spotter activation at the high school and officers began working with Twin Rivers Police. Located a student that had been shot in the arm. Uh, that student was quickly transported to an area hospital. Uh, he sustained a, a gunshot wound, non-life threatening, non-critical to his arm. Working together with Twin Rivers, they quickly apprehended the uh, individual involved in the shooting down the street. Police say the shooting happened on campus outside in this parking lot. The suspect, a 14 year old boy, was transported to juvenile hall and booked on assault related charges. The victim is a 17 year old boy. What led to the shooting is now under investigation, but students say they're fed up with the violence surrounding their school. This is not the first time. It's pretty frustrating that it's something that keeps going on. And of course, I want to be safe at school. Like that's something that's so important to me, my family, my mother, of course. Um, I just, it's pretty sick. Like we should not have to be dealing with this every day. I hate that this happened so much at the school and we're expected to go back the next day like nothing happened. Cause something did happen.
Because of the situation, Richard Baer says he's taking it upon himself to talk to his daughter and warn her about possible shootings. But you got to leave yourself an exit. Everywhere we go, everywhere we restaurants, I have to sit facing the door. So we, we stay on top of the situations like that because you never know. And it's not, like I said, it's not just school, it's life, unfortunately. The Twin Rivers Unified School District is encouraging students and families to speak to Sacramento police if they have any details on the situation that happened here today. They also say that they have a support team which is going to be speaking to families and students if they need someone to talk to. Alex, back to you in studio. All right, Roxanne, thank you. In other news tonight, hours of additional video footage from the deadly police beating of Sacramento native Tyree Nichols have been released by the city of Memphis. The footage contains hours of never before seen content from different angles. The video has been posted on our website. The deadly traffic stop happened back on January 7th of 2023. Five officers have been charged in connection so far with his death and the attorneys that represent the Nichols family put out a statement saying in part quote as our legal team reviews the new body cam videos we expect the videos to affirm what we have said from day one that there was absolutely no justification for the officers brutal and inhumane actions we will continue our unflinching look at this tragedy and stand strongly with Tyree's family in their continued grief and fight for justice. In an effort to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over his handling of the border continues. House Republicans made their case today to remove Mayorkas from office, accusing him of willful and systemic refusal to comply with law and breach of public trust. He comes in here and he raises his hand and he swears to tell the truth and then he lies when he says the border secure. Marcus fired back in a letter saying the charges against him are baseless and inaccurate. House Speaker Johnson says he plans to bring the articles of impeachment to the floor, likely by next week. Meantime, a bipartisan Senate bill to strengthen the southern border appears to be going nowhere with the House Speaker. He's calling it a non-starter. From what we've seen, clearly what's been what's been suggested is in this bill is not enough to secure the border. President Biden claims he's exhausted all of his executive authority to address the immigration crisis, telling Congress he needs money to do it now. Tonight, President Biden says that he's made a decision on how the U.S. will respond to that deadly drone attack in Jordan that killed three service members. Rena Roy has the latest. President Biden speaking with reporters before boarding Marine One Tuesday, announcing he has a retaliation plan after the deadly drone attack in Jordan that killed three U.S. service members and wounded more than 40 others. Yes. A U.S. official telling ABC News that the response will be carried out over the course of several days, saying that we'll see very deliberate strikes on facilities that enabled these attacks. There have been more than 160 attacks on U.S. forces in the region since Hamas's attack on Israel in October. They'll go after not only the proxy forces, infrastructure, personnel, leadership, but potentially the IRGC, which is the Iranian group that works with these groups in Syria and Iraq. The key here for the White House, responding in a way that will send a strong message without starting another war. We do not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want to see escalation of this conflict. Biden not directly holding Iranian officials responsible, but blaming them for arming the radical militants who carried out this latest drone attack. I do hold respons them responsible in the sense that they're supplying the weapons to the people who did it. U.S. officials tell ABC News the attack happened early Sunday morning at Tower 22, a remote U.S. outpost in the Jordanian desert. The Pentagon says the soldiers were asleep in their beds when the strike hit. An explosives-laden drone bypassing U.S. air defenses. Officials telling ABC News the one-way enemy attack drone approached the base around the same time as a U.S. surveillance drone, causing confusion and preventing the U.S. from deploying air defenses. And White House officials say that Biden has spoken to the families of the fallen soldiers. He will attend the dignified transfer on Friday when their bodies arrive back on U.S. soil. Coming up onto the point, protecting our salmon, what the governor plans to do. And we're tracking the first bands of rain making their way onto the coast when we're expecting rain, snow, and the wind to kick up here. And later, meet the local retired 49ers player rooting for their victory in the Super Bowl. The guys that are going to Las Vegas, they, they know what they have to do. They're going to lay it all out on the line. 
and go for it. All right, Chief Meteorologist Monica Woods, we saw record highs again today. It was beautiful. It was nice and warm. I know, third day in the <laughs> row. Take a look at some of these afternoon highs throughout the region, reaching the upper 60s, lower 70s, Stockton, Modesto, and downtown Sacramento, all with record highs for today. 50s up top for this year and near 70 throughout the foothills. But again, big changes coming at this time tomorrow. Wednesday night into Thursday is when the brunt of the storm comes blasting through here. The wind gusts up to about 35 to almost 45 miles per hour. A wind advisory in effect. We've got the heavy rain developing overnight. Periods of heavy rain through very early Thursday before the morning commute. And it's all because of this storm brewing in the Pacific that's about to make its presence known in our region. Again, winter storm warning in effect starting tomorrow, lasting through Friday into Saturday. Friday flood watch in effect, so that starts up tomorrow. We'll continue through that Friday morning outlook. And then for the Central Valley, we've got the wind advisory in effect that starts up tomorrow. It expires at 4 a.m., so that kind of gives you the time frame of what we're expecting here with the peak wind gusts coming in primarily right around 9 to 10 o'clock at night. Wind gusts up to about 35 to 45 plus miles per hour. Possibility of some tree branches and even some weak trees coming down might want to charge those phones and vehicles tonight into early tomorrow because once this starts up, it really continues to go through our Friday forecast. Our morning commute, not a bad one. It's during the afternoon that we start to see that rain picking up. So just about the time you're trying to pick the kids up from school, get out to some of those practices as well as the evening commute, things will really start to get going. And again, the heaviest rain coming in during the overnight hours. Thursday morning commute. Still kind of wet out there with a nearly an inch to an inch and a half of rain throughout the valley, closer to about, about two to three inches of rain for the foothills and close to about one to two feet and in some pockets, three feet of snow for the Sierra. So again, that 10 day forecast tomorrow, it is rain during the afternoon, mainly through the overnight hours. Slight chance of a thunderstorm on Thursday. Now Friday morning, still a slight chance of those lingering showers. Saturday dry, put another weather system starts to move through on Sunday and that takes us to the beginning of next week. February is here and winter returns. All right, Monica, thank you so much. After the break, our weather conversation continues how you can prepare your home ahead of the storms. Welcome back. Right now we are on storm watch with the upcoming storms. People are having flashbacks to last January. I mean, we saw trees that were damaged. They damaged homes. We had massive power outages that lasted for days. And tonight our Jeannie Nguyen is talking with the experts about how you can prepare before the rain, wind and snow begin. It's been more than a year since a tree fell on this midtown home. This is the strike point right here on the front porch. Homeowner Juan Lao has shared his story with ABC 10 and is still struggling to get it fixed after the January 2023 storms. Over the summer, he put up a sign in front of his house expressing his frustrations with permitting and the city. A year later, this is how Lao's home looks today. Lao tells ABC 10 that his house now has a roof and electrical work will be done soon. All of this work estimated to cost around $80,000 and he's hoping his insurance company will help foot the bill. What you need to know is this tree, tree coverage does exist as long as it hits something that's insured. Dave Phillips with State Farm Insurance says there are a few things homeowners can do right now to prepare for a storm. Take a look at your trees, your tree limbs, if there's dead branches. Um, you don't want them, especially heavier branches, falling on your house, which potentially could cause roof and shingle damage. Take pictures of what your property looks like now and after the storm. Phillips says there are some things homeowners can do if there's damage. Take photos. Um, save receipts if you've done any loss mitigation measures to kind of shore up maybe holes in the roof, um, things along those lines so that you have that ready for your insurer. As for Lao's home, while there isn't a sign in front of it today, he says the city still has been an obstacle, but he's hoping to be able to move back into his house by May. Now, a city spokesperson tells us a permit has been issued at Lao's home and work is currently being done there, adding that he still needs to schedule inspections until the project is finished. And one thing that always comes up is flood insurance. And most standard homeowners insurance policies don't have it. I know we were talking about this earlier today. Of course, yes. You know, we are living in an area that is prone to flooding. So flood insurance can be purchased on top of a standard policy. 
flood insurance policies usually require people to purchase them at least 30 days before they take effect. Yeah, that's right. And ahead of the potential flooding and heavy rains, there are sandbag locations set up. They're running right now. They're across Northern California, including one in Sacramento County. So sandbags, they can be used to reduce your flood water damage. You can find a full list of all those locations right now on our website, abc10.com. Tonight, Governor Gavin Newsom wants to fast track more than half a dozen projects to remove or bypass dams that have blocked salmon. And the plan comes as the largest dam removal project in U.S. history is underway along the California and Oregon border. So millions of salmon once filled California streams and rivers. But last year, there were so few salmon that officials closed the commercial fishing season. Newsom's strategy includes promises to remove or even bypass seven barriers to the salmon in the state's rivers, including two dams in Mendocino County and one in Los Angeles County. Newsom also pledged to continue to work with native tribes who often refer to the rivers where the salmon live as their church. All right, the 49ers are headed to the Super Bowl and they will play the Kansas City Chiefs in Vegas on February 11th. And one man that is surely rooting for their victory is retired 49ers player Eddie Lewis, who lives in Lincoln. And he tells me that he is still studying the 49ers moves. On a quiet ranch in Lincoln is where former San Francisco 49ers defensive back Eddie Lewis calls home. That's me. The football star's passion didn't start on the football field. My true love was track. I was All-American track in high school and football. Education always came first for Lewis. Once he graduated from the University of Kansas, he was drafted to the 49ers. We have Jerry Rice, we have me in the middle, uh, Tom Rathman, Ronnie Lott, Roger Craig, me in Montana at the top at a practice, and that's me returning an interception. Reality set in during his first NFL games. Your rookie season is like you at Disneyland and you are a newborn baby because you don't know anything how it works. Because now it's real. You're getting paid for it. So it's real. It takes a lot of work. Better plays are made in practice than on the field. If you can't remember the plays and can't do the plays, then you get somebody hurt or you get a touchdown made on you or whatever. Lewis says that he's still studying the 49ers moves today. This is 2023 uh, yearbook and it's informative. He says the players work well together. Kettle, Debo, Ayuk, and the quarterback, of course. And McCafferty, he's, about, he's the bomb. So if he doesn't make MVP, I don't know who should. As for the Super Bowl. The guys that are going to Las Vegas, they know what they have to do. They're going to lay it all out on the line and go for it. If you believe in yourself and continue to work hard, things will work out for you. Brock Purdy, he was, a, what, the last player picked in the draft? <laughs> so you have to believe in yourself. And after Lewis's NFL retirement. You have to find yourself. It could take a year or two to really find yourself. What do I want to become now? Lewis says conversations off the field are just as important as the ones on the turf. You need that person that you trust to talk to about your issues. And that's a big thing. And they just, the 49ers have been the front runner in this. And that's a big issue that people don't realize outside of the game. I know that I have help out there. I'm not alone. That's the big thing. I'm not alone. We had a lot of laughs yesterday, and I did ask Mr. Lewis what are his plans for the Super Bowl. He said that he's been to enough Super Bowl games to prefer something a little bit more low-key, and his ideal Super Bowl party would be on this Saturday before the big game, so when the game is on on Sunday, he can actually focus without any interruptions. Now, we will be live at the big game, so don't miss our coverage from Vegas all next week right here on To The Point. All right, coming up on To The Point, the state anticipating a surge in those 65 and older, so what's being done about it?
California is expecting a boom in its aging population in the coming years. And with that comes concerns about housing, health care, and loneliness for our senior population. So coming up tomorrow on a special edition of ABC 10 News at 1030, ABC 10's Becca Hobbeg reports on what the state is doing to address this surge in people 65 and older. And hear from a woman who is now in affordable housing for low-income seniors, but was experiencing homelessness less than two years ago. Every one of us have different reasons as to why we personally end up where we are. You know, most seniors don't make enough money. And if not for these programs, you know, how could, how could one live? You know, it's, it's just really unfortunate. How we can all prepare for the future and what the state is doing to help. That is tomorrow night at 1030. And that's because the NBA, the NBA game is on tomorrow on primetime, which means to the point we'll be back on Thursday at 630. As always, you already know, we love to hear from you and let us know what's going on in your community. You can always email me and the team to the point at abc10.com. Thanks for watching and I'll see you Thursday. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.